Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for having me here, and Teresa, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, like Dr. Hutt, I have to admit, too, that uh, as a postdoc, I first heard uh, you speak about the Onco Fertility Consortium, and I was blown away by the idea uh, and developed a, a huge scientific crush on this concept of, of how do, can we preserve fertili uh, fertility uh, in these patients. Um, so uh, a lot of my talk that I'm going to talk about today is this, uh, how can we look at uh, multi-generational impacts, uh, especially with, with relation to some uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, data. Uh, I just want to mention any disclosure right now. I don't have any relationships with any companies, uh, but I do have a provisional patent that's covering a lot of the data uh, that I'll show you today um, with my, uh, my uh, collaborator and partner, uh, Dr. Anthony Chan. Um, and we're currently in the process of forming a company, so this will change in a little bit. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of the actual, some of the, the stuff that we're trying to push forward on that, but I, I will uh, uh, highlight some of the, the new stuff that we're, we're getting into. Uh, but what I really want to talk about today is these paternal impacts uh, on, on human disease and how this relates to oncofertility uh, preservation. So I, I'm sure a number of you in here have heard of the paternal aging effect, which is this concept that as men age, uh, they acquire mutations within their germline stem cells, and that, that, and that this can lead to um, uh, birth, well not, well not necessarily birth defects, but uh, uh, increased risk for certain diseases uh, in their offspring, uh, including neurological diseases, uh, such as a higher incidence of autism and schizophrenia, and then also higher incidences of cancers. Um, we also see within spermatogenesis uh, this concept of anticipation uh, with uh, Huntington's disease. So the, the trinucleotide repeat disorder, Huntington's disease, the, that repeat expands uh, during uh, spermatogenesis. Uh, you also have, as this study highlights uh, uh, right here, uh, that there is an impact and there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that not just maternal health, but also paternal health uh, prior to conception can contribute to uh, health defects uh, in offspring. Uh, and this can include uh, issues with, uh, and this includes issues with imprinting disorders uh, going forward. So what really, really, uh, why this kind of ties into the Oncofertility Consortium is uh, with a number of drugs out there that are used to treat childhood cancers, uh, in, in situations where the, the, the patients aren't rendered sterile, we don't know what these drugs are going to do to the individual, uh, individual's germline stem cells, and will they cause any mutation that can then be passed on um, to offspring and contribute to defects in the health of their offspring, and possibly even further down the line in future generations. And so we have this concept of gene-environment interaction. You know, there are very, very few things on, on either end of the spectrum where things like cystic fibrosis that are purely genetic and things like, uh, you know, for instance, like a lead exposure that will render an, an individual sterile. Uh, there are very few, you know, things on the border, but it's this, this, uh, this medium area is where mostly life lives. And so for certain individuals, it, uh, these risks of these chemotherapies could have major implications on their germline genetics that could impact uh, and, and also epigenetics, and could impact the, uh, the uh, their future offspring uh, from this. So we really, really do need to develop a model that could kind of understand this and really look into how, th how these, these drugs are on the market, uh, how they not only impact male fertility, but also how they can contribute to, um, to defects uh, within the germline that could be transplanted to uh, the next generation. And this kind of hits at an NIH initiative referred to as DOHAD, uh, the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. So this is where uh, my, uh, my work comes into uh, with this uh, in vitro model of human spermatogenesis that, that we've developed. Now, I need to specify right now, uh, this, this, uh, this diagram uh, is, is a little misleading because we, uh, I mean, well, there's been no study that's shown complete spermatogenesis in vitro using human cells uh, so far. And I have to point out right here, as we get to about this stage, is that? Yeah. So right around just the, the round starting to elongate stage uh, in vitro. But the idea behind this is that we can take a pluripotent stem cell, uh, differentiate this, and produce undifferentiated and differentiating spermatogonia, primary and secondary spermatocytes, and round spermatids that, that start to elongate a, a little bit from this. We do get uh, pa uh, 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 DNA repackaging, so we get the protamine for histone switching, and I'll show some of the data here in a second. But this model then allows us to start to understand, well, how do these, some of these, these new uh, chemotherapies that come on the market or some of the ones that are existing, how not only do they affect male fertility uh, in a, a human in vitro model, but also we can look to see how it affects the epigenome as well. 
So this is just a little bit of an overview of, of what we published in, in 2012 when I was a postdoc on Dr. Joel Shatton's lab in collaboration with Dr. Kyle Orwig. Uh, we took human pluripotent stem cells, both uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and embryonic stem cells. And we differentiated in our culture conditions, um, and then we actually um, uh, we showed that in in, the, in this study we showed the uh, well this part of the study we showed the expression of uh, uh, the pan germ cell marker VASA and that this paranuclear localization is similar to what you would see uh, in a cross section of human seminiferous tubules. We also looked at PLZF, which is a marker for stem and progenitors from Patagonia. We showed that this is expressed uh, in our differentiating cultures. Now, our differentiating cultures, as you'll see right here uh, in this third uh, third line down, both in the ESC line and in the IPSC line, uh, the differentiating colonies don't look like uh, a seminiferous tubule, like a cross section. I was really hoping that they would, um, but we have kind of a chaotic organization, so we don't have the stem cell uh, pool around the periphery of the seminiferous tubule like you would see in a human testis. We have them mixed throughout this uh, in this 3D colony. Uh, we also have generated both undifferentiated and differentiating spermatogonia. Uh, these markers uh, indicate primary and secondary spermatocytes. Uh, and we've also had markers associated with spermatids, including acrosin, protamine 1, and transition protein 1. So this kind of just highlights that we can get pretty far uh, down the line within our in vitro spermatogenesis model. Uh, we've also recently, I don't show this data right now, but we've also improved this model to use a feeder-free system. So this, this improved rigor and reproducibility of our system because with that stove feeder that we originally published in 2012, uh, if you had any viability issues with that stove feeder, your differentiation potential went to hell. So we ended up uh, improving and doing a, a, a feeder-free system to, to, to add uh, a more robustness to our, to, our, um, to our system. But I should also talk about with this system that we've, si uh, since our 2012 publication, we published three studies showing that we could utilize this model to study the impacts of of environmental toxicants on uh, fertility, and we mimic clinical phenotypes with known reproductive toxicants. So not only does the model you know, get pretty far during spermatogenesis, but it also can be used to study the impacts of environmental exposures, and we would like to start doing that with, uh, uh, with chemotherapies. Now I have to take a step back here. Uh, we have not done any of these studies yet with examining uh, the, um, uh, with any, uh, uh, chemotherapy agents like cisplatin or whatnot. Uh, so what I'm going to show you today is a study that links to a human cohort. It's not, uh, it's not a cancer therapy, so I do apologize for that. But it's a really interesting cohort that we've tied into that has transgenerational health concerns, and I want to show you how we can start to model some of this and how we can then use this model uh, to go forward to, to look at the impacts of, onco uh, of uh, uh, oncotherapies. So this particular uh, study that, that we do that, that ties in this human cohort uh, involves around a, an exposure event that happened in the 1970s in Michigan, where this, this chemical company, Michigan Chemical Company, made two products. One that was called uh, Feedmaster, uh, which was just a, a, like a, a, a cattle feed supplement. The other one was Firemaster, which was a flame retardant, uh, a polybrominated flame retardant. They had two bags for this, red bag for the Firemaster, blue bag for the Feedmaster. They ran out of blue bags, and somebody had the bright idea to just take a Sharpie and, and write Feedmaster on the red bags. Uh, not shockingly, that poor quality control, uh, the company shipped the wrong thing to the Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau then took that fire, uh, the flame retardant, mixed it in with cattle feed, sent it out to all the farmers. It got incorporated into the food chain in, in Michigan, and about 6.5 million residents in Michigan in the 1970s consumed contaminated beef poultry and dairy products from this. Now I should point out this, this flame retardant, which also by the way is completely uh, uh, ineffective at, at suppressing fires. Uh, <laughs> as somebody who lives down in the south in Georgia, when the you know, football team wins, you see a lot of people on campus lighting couches on fire. A lot of these couches have flame retardants in them. So you can see very easily they're not that, that effective from this. Uh, but the worst part about this is these things have no known half-lives. So today, 40 plus years after the fact, you could still detect insane levels of this chemical in these individuals, and it's still having an effect on their body. Uh, it doesn't get cleared out of the body very easily because it's, it's fat soluble. Um, it's not, also not metabolized by the liver at all, so it just can, constantly circulates and has a major effect. 
so not only did this have a major, major impact on the, the economy and the farming uh, in Michigan, uh, but it also had this huge human component to this. Um, and so nowadays, Dr. Michelle Marcus uh, runs a cohort uh, of, of, of these members. Uh, the number is, I, I think yesterday she mentioned, I think was about 7,500 now uh, that they've recruited into the study. Um, and they're starting to understand some of the, that now they have three generations out from this original event. And they're seeing major health defects three generations out that are completely unexplained by genetics. Um, and so they're really starting to understand, they really want to understand how this chemical exposure impacts across multiple generations, uh, which is where we like to think my lab comes in to start to look at this. So one of the things that they talked about uh, in meeting with the, the members of, of this cohort uh, was that the, there was a large number of spontaneous abortions and stillbirths and a number of growth defects in offspring uh, that were born across not just one generation, but multiple generations. So that kind of gave rise to ideas, are, are, do we have an impact on epigenetics at all with the, this chemical exposure? Now what's really interesting is a lot of this, and what we're trying to, now it's, it's more anecdotal because we don't have a, a strong enough in value, uh, but right now what we're seeing is, is in families where just the father was exposed to the chemical, the mother was not, so there was no in utero exposure, they're having their, their health defects in the offspring and then the offspring's offspring, uh, those offspring that, that live and are able to produce. The worst thing about this, you know, when we start talking about some of the, the impacts on sperm, these, the guys that got exposed to this chemical at these insane levels weren't rendered sterile at all. In fact, the, and there's one study that suggests that their sperm parameters actually improved. So they actually had more sperm per uh, mill of ejaculate, they had better motility, uh, and they had fewer uh, structural defects uh, with, within their system. So not that they were more fertile, but that their, 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 their sperm parameters uh, seemed to be improved. However, they were having uh, uh, significant health defects in their offspring. So we took, uh, a, 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 amongst a huge age range, we took uh, uh, roughly 100, well, we actually started with 103 samples, uh, but I found out when I was isolating DNA of these samples, uh, three of them, we couldn't isolate any DNA, DNA at all. And so when I contacted the, the coordinator, I was like, hey, you know, does this guy stay alone? And they're like, oh, no, that actually got, uh, got a vasectomy. I was like, well, his vasectomy definitely works because he has no sperm in his ejaculate. But, um, <laughs> So that was kind of fun. <laughs> but with this, we were able to look at the, we were look at the impacts uh, on H19 methylation. This is, now this is a region within the male chromosome that's uh, on the male, uh, male DNA, that is uh, male genome, that is heavily methylated to silence this. So this is a, uh, this is a, a, a gene region that is uh, uh, paternally silenced and then maternally inherited. Uh, well, you inherit both copies, but only one of them is, is active, and so it's silence on the, the paternal chromosome. Uh, and so what we, we decided to look at is we looked at both a an internal control from the cohort, and then we purchased samples from Zytex that had no affiliation with Michigan whatsoever at all, so we could rule out any Michigan effects. And combined the two, we've shown that, uh, that men with circulating levels, regardless of age or anything like that, with circulating levels of this compound, uh, PVB-153, which is the Firemaster mix, uh, had a significant reduction in H H19 methylation. Uh, now, some of the ones that are, that are either a biallelically expressor or paternally expressor genes had low methylation and didn't have any significant uh, impacts. But something that, that had a, that was supposed to be heavily methylated was significantly unmethylated. And this could potentially contribute to, to uh, uh, intergenerational uh, health disorders. So we did some whole methylene sequencing uh, of one of the samples and compared this to two control samples. And we actually highlight this, uh, we, we confirm what we saw with our PCR-based system, uh, where the H19 uh, imprint control region, well this is a more zoomed up region on this, you can see the purple lines indicate uh, methylation. Uh, this was 20x coverage, so we had very good coverage on this. And you can see the significant loss in methylation uh, in the PBB sample compared to, the, to our, our control samples. We've looked at uh, other uh, uh, paternally silenced uh, region as well, uh, uh, DLK MAG3. If you look globally, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference, but when you actually look at the, the imprint control region that actually is, that should be methylated to, to silence the, uh, this gene product, uh, we actually see a, a complete loss of methylation on this. To suggest that it's not just H19, this is across the board, things that should be methylated are, are largely unmethylated.
We've also looked at some other genes that are paternally expressed, so they should have low, level, low levels of methylation to begin with. And I apologize that this is probably a little, um, a little hard to see in the, in the back, but um, uh, I'm happy to show you afterwards. Uh, but these samples, in, in all cases where we looked at uh, paternally expressed genes that should have low levels of methylation, the PBB sample even had reduced levels after that to suggest that this de novo methylation that's, that's supposed to establish DNA imprint, I mean, to establish imprints, uh, are being disturbed by this chemical. And then this is two other genes. Now, what's really, really important about this uh, with our human sample is uh, the timing of imprint establishment in humans is distinctly different from that of rodents. In humans, imprints are established at the spermatogonial stem cell stage throughout the entire adult life of an individual. So this also means what uh, um, uh, boys undergoing chemotherapy could have their imprints being affected by uh, chemotherapy because it's a constant process throughout the adult life uh, of a male at the spermatogonial stem cell stage, where rodents do it at the primordial germ cell stage far earlier in development. So our model we thought, and this is the human spermatogenesis model, we wanted to look at the impacts and to see whether we could actually mimic the phenotype that we saw uh, within the human population. And what we can confirm right here is that we've had a significant reduction um, in uh, 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 H19 methylation, not to the same extent, but again, this is a lot shorter time versus you know, uh, years of exposure, and we, we did this over a 10-day period. Uh, but we were able to show the significant reduction in DNA methylation, similar to what you would, you would, you would see with, within the, uh, the human cohort. So we thought that our model uh, now mimics this. And why this is important is that we're able to look at mechanism, where before, that's, it, it's really difficult to do. Uh, I, I could confirm, uh, we, we put out a survey out for the, the PBB cohort, asking if any guy would be interested in donating parts of their testis uh, for studying to look at some mechanistic <laughs> studies. And having seen that surgery up close and personal, I can tell you that I, I wouldn't volunteer for that either. Uh, so we didn't have any volunteers for that. Um, so our in vitro model now is, is a way for us to really look at the mechanism behind how these chemicals, and in the future for, uh, for chemotherapy agents, to look to see how they're impacting the epigenome um, and, and the genome as well, and, and look at the actual underlying mechanism of how these chemicals uh, cause these defects, whereas we can't really do that in a, in a, in a, in a human testis model. So what was really interesting, when we start to look at this chemical, this PBB-153, we noticed there was a similar structural, uh, a, a sh similar structure uh, to Reveratrol, which is a known de novo uh, DNA methyltransferase uh, inhibitor. And since we, DNA, uh, DNA, de novo DNA methyltransferase are responsible for establishing imprints at the spermatogonial uh, stem cell stage, we thought maybe PBB could be impacting uh, uh, the, these particular enzymes, and this could be the reason why we have this loss of DNA methylation on our imprinted control regions. And we actually did some computer modeling to show that it binds within the exact same pocket as resveratrol. Uh, it's not quite as efficient as resveratrol, which explains why we don't have the, the same uh, uh, enzymatic kinetics with when we treat with uh, resveratrol compared to PBB. Uh, but we, we, it still binds the same pocket, still has uh, the ability to inhibit the enzyme uh, from a modeling perspective. And so we took this in, into, um, with our in vitro model, and we actually treated with PBB and then looked at de novo uh, DNA methyltransferase activity and methyl, uh, and, excuse me, and maintenance methylation, which is our DNA methyl, uh, methyltransferase 1 activity. What we showed is primarily your de novo methyltransferase activity was significantly impacted uh, by the presence of PBB153. Uh, we also know that it's a direct effect because we can take control uh, lysate from our in vitro model and in the uh, in vitro analysis, enzymatic analysis, we can just plug PBB153 uh, directly in and we cause a significant reduction um, in uh, activity based on just adding it directly into that assay. Uh, so this is not even pretreatment, this, uh, this is just adding it directly in. So with the, and we also showed some, uh, some inhibition uh, on, on the maintenance methylations. So this could be a, a dual hit where this particular, uh, this particular chemical affects both the de novo, which will establish imprints, and the maintenance one, which will then uh, will perpetuate it through the, uh, the primary spermatocyte stage uh, in humans. So this was a really interesting find to show that this is a chemical that, that could do the, this kind of, uh, that could have this kind of impact uh, and contribute to altering the epigenome, which could then lead to, uh, it, it could explain some of the, the developmental defects uh, in the next generation. 
And that this kind of model system uh, will enable us to, to look at some of the, the, the chemotherapies to see if they have any impact on the epigenome uh, and could contribute to, to any defects uh, in the next generation. So again, looking at, at next generation, uh, it's this big issue of uh, transgenerational inheritance. So how do we, how can we, well, basically how can we look at how these uh, oncotherapies and see how they impact across multiple generations. So the idea is like if an individual gets, gets treated with a chemical, is, uh, their fertility is recovered, does that impact the health of their offspring, the, their offspring and then their grandchildren, et cetera, down the line? And this becomes a really, really expensive study to do if you're going to try to do this in animals or even like a human cohort uh, to do this, plus time. Uh, I think we all in here that if we want to do this in humans to do across multiple generations to show a transgenerational impact, I think it would take about 60 to 70 years. Um, I'm pretty sure I won't be allowed to see the end of that study, and I doubt the NIH would want to fund me for 60 or 70 years. Um, but so the idea from this is how in the world can you do this um, in a model that's relevant to humans to, that, to look into this. So we wanted to, to, to take our in vitro model and see if we can fertilize, an o using monkeys now, not humans so we don't have any ethical issues, but take our in vitro model, take the spermatids that we can produce from this, fertilize an egg, and then actually develop this in vitro transgenerational model where we can do a preconception exposure and then actually fertilize an egg, develop out to blast the stage, make stem cell lines from this. With the male lines, we differentiate those into spermatids, fertilize oocytes, and continue that process down the line. And what we figured out mathematically is that we could get about 15 generations doing that uh, over, the, over about uh, an eight-year period. Uh, and so that really starts to make, make this a little bit more manageable to, to look at, at a multi-generational study. But I want to step back, too, because this is uh, the Oncofertility Consortium side. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how our uh, stem cell-based therapy uh, for uh, treating male infertility. So this figure was taken from uh, uh, work done by Dr. Amanda Clark and Dr. Kyle Orwig uh, in 2011 out of their Nature uh, uh, manuscript. And one part that I want to highlight is something that we're really interested in doing is the idea that we can take patient-specific stem cells uh, and from a skin biopsy or in different parts of the body, blood, et cetera, uh, de uh, derive an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then differentiate this into a haploid germ cell that we could then use to fertilize egg. So the idea of this would be a true stem cell-based therapy to treat uh, infertility caused by um, uh, chemotherapy. And so to, to look at this, we took to a, to a, a non-human primate model, something that would, that would more mimic the human condition. And so again, this kind of talks about a little bit of what, how we wanted to model our transgenerational impacts, but the same thing applies for the, the regenerative uh, medicine therapy, the idea of can we use a monkey model, take stem cells, differentiate them into spermatids, fertilize eggs, produce blastocysts, isolate the inner cell mass, take our stem cell lines and the male lines, differentiate them in spermatids, fertilize and go back and forth. And this, uh, this stem cell spermatid fertilization, stem cell model will allow us to do multiple generations uh, in vitro and look at the impacts of a paternal preconception exposure across multiple generations. Uh, so this is the work done by uh, Dr. Anthony Chan and myself. Uh, with the same model as before uh, that we showed in 2012. We can differentiate uh, non-human primate rhesus uh, stem cells, both ES and uh, ES, IPS, and somatic cell nuclear transfer derived stem cells, so two forms of patient specific stem cells. We can differentiate those. We can produce vasopositive cells. We can produce uh, PLZF positive cells. We can produce haploid spermatids that express acrosin. Um, we've also now recently taken a GFP line just to show you some of the data here in a second, because uh, it's easier for us to mark the impacts, uh, uh, to trace the lineages uh, within our developing embryos. Uh, but the, the our GFP lines, uh, we can differentiate um, as well. Uh, they express PLZF, uh, UTF1, and different chain spermatogonia marker, uh, secondary spermatocyte marker. Uh, we also can produce within our, our, our haploid spermatids, we do get a partial tail formation. Uh, we can, we do produce both X and Y spermatids. Um, we, we do have this haplogroup when we do this, and we, the idea is that we can inject these spermatids into rhesus oocytes uh, from this. So, I mean, this is just an example where we inject it in, so it's, it's not a MET2 oocyte. But now we can actually do this, and we're doing this all in rhesus. 
Our haploid sperm tests we confirmed express normal haploid markers that we'd expect. From the imprinted regions that are known in rhesus, uh, they match. This is what the stem cell line looks like. This is what the, uh, the spermatids look like. This is what you would expect to see in monkey sperm as well. Morphologically, this is what elongated uh, spermatids look like from a rhesus testis. Uh, our in vitro derived spermatids, these are two that kind of stuck together. But you can see from a DIC image uh, with these inserts, they look very similar. Now, from the microtubule network and some other parts, they, they aren't the same, so they're not el uh, elongating. They're not really elongating, but they're, they're starting to elongate uh, from this. But again, the proof is in the pudding. Can we actually inject these into oocytes and get something out of it? And so this is the particular study that, that we've done. Uh, this is unpublished yet. We're about to submit this publication where we've actually taken our GFP, uh, stem cell, a GFP positive stem cell line, differentiated spermatids, injected them into oocytes, and we can produce all the way to a blastocyst uh, stage. Um, and, and the GFP is retained in, in, in all the cells that, that we see from both the inner cell mass uh, and uh, the trophectoderm uh, from this. This is a time course of, of that particular embryo. So this is right after fertilization. Uh, this is the two cell stage, eight cell stage, uh, early morula, uh, compacted morula, and then the actual blastocyst stage. This all happened within six days uh, uh, post-fertilization as we'd expect with rhesus. Uh, and it produced a very healthy looking uh, blastocyst and we're, and we're capable of doing this now with, with great efficiency. Uh, but I need to point out too, right now, uh, we do have some limitations uh, with this that we've overcome uh, recently. And so I wanted to highlight this here. The spermatids, even that very nice looking uh, in vitro spermatid that we made right here that's got a tail, even this one itself is not capable of activating the egg on its own. So even when we just inject them straight in, nothing happens. You get DNA decondensation on the spermatid, you get a sperm master formation, just nothing happens to the egg. The egg doesn't get, go through anything. So we spent a little bit of time trying to, trying to overcome that particular barrier uh, with trying some things that we're going to obviously produce triploid embryos like ion uh, IN4 and DMAP treatment. Uh, but what we settled on is something is we realized uh, that even with, with doing uh, a, we used a treatment of, uh, uh, where we're using sperm, sperm factor to activate the egg, and we could generate uh, diploid healthy uh, blastus by this, but our efficiency was terrible. Uh, in fact, we only generated one when, when we did it this way. Uh, and, it was, uh, and we kind of got nervous because we started to do this several times, and we realized we had a major, major arrest when the embryonic genome was supposed to kick on. And so we started to analyze this, and we realized that our spermatids that we made in vitro lacked the TET enzymes that were responsible for demethylating, that causing that wave of demethylation right at, uh, at fertilization, and allowing, eventually allowing the, the embryonic genome to, to turn on. Once we, we, we found a, a good paradigm from doing this, so we put in purified TET3 protein with our sperm cell factor. We also added some uh, cDNA in that to, to prolong it and use a trichostatin A. We, we in, ended up generating, uh, uh, well, our efficiency increased exponentially uh, from this. And we've actually improved it since then, and so we're almost closer uh, to about 20 percent. And this is almost in line than if you use uh, controlled sperm from a monkey. So this study right here is that with our sperm cell factor, with the TET3, uh, with the DNA, with the TSA treatment um, at fertilization, we actually can get similar to what, what you would see if you actually injected uh, uh, rhesus oocytes with rhesus sperm. Our efficiencies are, are very close. This particular inset right here just shows the level of expression of TET3 uh, in the ES cells and even in our 10-day spermatids that we generate, we're still sufficiently and significantly less than what you would see it with sperm. So we think that our one that snuck through on its own just happened to have enough to get through, but it's really this, this addition of TET3 that's really, really driving this. So with the ability now to make blasts uh, uh, at a high efficiency rate for, uh, for what we need, we now can generate enough that we can generate stem cell lines and we can start to do this transgenerational uh, model. But this also does represent what we're looking to do for our stem cell based therapies uh, to treat uh, male, male factor infertility. Uh, so with that, you know, I just would like to, to make some concluding remarks to, to say that we believe that our model now will allow us to examine environmental exposures and drug and, and uh, chemotherapy exposures to how these can, can alter either the genome or the epigenome uh, in spermatids that can contribute to, to health defects in, in later generations. 
And we also think we now have a model with our rhesus study that can allow us to look transgenerationally and look across multiple generations to see how, how a, a paternal preconception exposure impacts uh, across multiple generations. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my lab and my collaborators uh, and my funding sources, and I uh, will take any questions you guys have.